Hey everybody, we've got a fantastic video for you today because this is my first hands-on off-road look at the Ineos Grenadier and we're going to answer the simple question, how does this full British brute compare to vehicles like the Jeep Gladiator and the Ford Bronco that us Yanks are used to and Alex, why am I using these funny terminologies? Where are we at? Because we are at Goodwood in the UK. Yep, that's right. Old Blighty. That's right. So Alex Dykes from Alex on Auto's Auto Buyer's Guide is with me today and we're going to take a detailed look at the Grenadier and find out not only does this vehicle have the features to compete with the Wrangler and the Bronco, but also the chops. Now you can see back there, we got a Grenadier struggling with the hill climb. We are out here on this super boggy, I think is the word they use, day. You want to just clip that to your uh, okay. your your collar there? All right. And Mark, you've been with Ineos for a number of years now. I have. I've been um, consulted in for about three years on this project. Very cool. And uh, has this been a fun one to work on? It is great. Because yeah. It's very exciting to be involved in a project, uh, building a new vehicle from complete scratch. From nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what I love about this vehicle right off the bat is it's such an interesting mix of kind of newer technologies with a large touchscreen display, but you still have a manual selection here for your transfer case for your high and your low range. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it, We've got obviously an ability here, we've got high range, but we've got low range for our kind of more intensity off-road conditions. Um, but it's back to levers, okay, um, you know, in terms of the, the range change. And it, it goes back also you know, to our kind of ethos about keeping elements simple, you know, mm. mechanical side as simple as we can. So range change um, is done from high to low, vehicle has to be stopped, it's not uh, neutral on the main transmission. Yep. But we've also got the same lever for the center diff lock, so be permanent 4x4 we can lock the center differential in the transfer gearbox but we can do it on the move okay so we can select and lock the center differential on the move as long as we're not spinning the wheels and high engine right RPM. first impression what do you think of the design I love it this is all kinds of gladiator meets Jeep meets G-Wagon meets Defender I love everything about it. So basically the story is there's a gentleman here in the UK that runs a very powerful petrochemical company. He loved the Defender, was really upset when Landover stopped making it and decided let's build our own. And that's what he did. There was a little bit of a lawsuit. He came out though on top with the Ineos Grenadier. Now this is a vehicle that has a body on frame construction with solid axles front and back. And this one, you can actually see the frame because they gave us a prototype with a red frame. So look at that, how cool is that? Yes. You can actually see all the frame elements there? Yeah, you got coil springs, obviously, front and rear, but the solid axle by a company called Carraro, which is kind of like the Italian version of Dana, as I understand it. And some cool specs on this vehicle, about 10 and a half inches of ground clearance and available proper locking differentials front and back. Let's pop the hood, Alex, see what the engine yes. looks like. I love the hood design because it has this very G-Wagon-y V-shaped hood and a pretty long front end, right? Because this has, under here, BMW inline six. Right. So, pretty small company relative to some of the major OEMs. And rather than develop their own engines, they went with a BMW uh, sourced in the US gasoline engine in the UK here, both gas and diesel options. The diesel engine is um, a little bit less powerful. The gas engine right around 280 some horsepower. But Alex, here's a question for you. If you were starting your own off-road company, would you go to BMW for engine designs? I probably would if I really wanted an inline six. So if I wanted low service costs, probably would have gone with GM and an LS. Well, and here's the, here's the thing. This is why I'm a little on the fence about this decision because this is a purpose-built, rugged off-roader from the start. BMW in the past hasn't had a fantastic reputation with some of their engines. Now this B58 unit we're getting in the States, I talked to some service advisors at my local dealer. They say they have seen very few complaints with it, but I am wondering, would they have been better off going with an LS or a, you know, a Toyota sourced engine? What do you think, Alex? I think the answer is that for Europe, where of course they're building them, an LS V8 is not as easy to come by. <laughs> so here, you know, the service building at V8, that would be a little bit trickier. 
Obviously, these are going to be selling better in the U.S., they said. They've actually, pre-orders have already exceeded U.K. pre-orders. And they've sold about a 1,000 here in the U.K. so far. Let's talk about wheel and tire package. So there's a couple different models. This one, I believe, is the Trial Master. I've been saying Trail Master incorrectly. It's Trial Master. And this is an 18-inch wheel wrapped in, oh, excuse me, a 17-inch wheel wrapped in the BFG KO2 tire, one of my favorite all-around tires. I Fant love that tire, too. Great in the snow, right? Yep. Fantastic and I love the wheel. I love the Steelies. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, right? We're looking at, in the U.S. market, a $75,000 plus vehicle with steel wheels. True frame mounted rock rail, too, which I'm loving. You can actually see with this red demonstrator unit that the rock rail is mounted directly. Let's take to a these look under there. Frame see that red frame. Very cool. That's really cool. I love the fact that they gave us this sort of engineering model with those little bits uh, in red, because you can also see you know, for instance, back here where the hitch is located, the hitch is also frame mounted. The frame extends right back there to the rear to that bumper and those recovery hooks. Those are also frame mounted units. Yep. So this is my kind of off-road panel. And what I have is obviously my front axle differential lock and my rear. Rear would obviously always be first engaged. Sure, right. And front after. Um, but they won't engage unless you've got a center diff lock in and that you're in low range. Right, and it's uh, you got to be in rear lock to, before you can lock the front. Absolutely. Yeah. There would okay. never ever be a time no. where you need a front. So it's, yeah, unless you're, you're in a Mickey's hot tub in Moab, but then yeah. you need an Atlas transfer case. Um, all right, cool. So wonderful. So let's let's uh, start moving okay. here. So, okay with so that? We're, we're in higher range, so. Yep. We've got a you know, gear lever, we'll go yep. into drive, so press the button, pull it back, we're in drive, yeah, and we're going to sweep around kind of clockwise. Wonderful. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, as long as you're comfortable, you've got a good position for your seat. So one thing I'm noticing right off the bat, which is surprising, um, is the steering is very, very light. Yeah. You know, some of the old school Wranglers that I've owned and driven, you expect kind of heavy hydraulic steering, but this feels like a pretty light electronic system, right? Elect electric power steering? So. We've got a, this is, this is obviously power, power assisted steering, so yep. you've got a recirculating, what's called a ball steering box. Mm -hmm. so you've got a, We've got a, a, an old school steering box, but in an off-road environment, it, A, it's very robust, very tough, right. okay, very um, secure, mm -hmm. okay, and in an off-road environment, you know, having that steering box, you've got less opportunity of what's called wheel shock, so so the wheel hitting the steering and turning your steering wheel. Not gonna break a finger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously the old school um, 4 by 4 from the UK, yeah. um, from Land Rover, I've been solid axle since the beginning, since the late 1940s. Yeah. Um, was there any consideration from the team to go with an independent suspension setup, or was it solid axle from the start? Solid axles from the start, and the reason for that is um, to reduce the complexity. So by having solid axles, you've got a rigid structure, okay, and you've got a lot less complexity in the in the drive line. So, so we're going to take the track up, going up to the to the left. To the left here, yeah. Okay, so just at the base of here, if you just bring the vehicle just to a stop, we just want to kind of talk about a couple of things as well. Um, we're going to do a range change now. Yep. If that's okay. Yeah, it's um, wonderful. We're going into what I call close country, and it's appropriate to go into low range. So we're in high at the moment, yep. normal kind of open terrain, road going position. So the range change is in neutral on there. So mm -hmm. engine will, will restart. I'll talk about a couple of other things as well, but we'll do the range change. So it's lifting that collar up and just pulling the lever back. All right. Do you mind if I do it? Are you good with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So that's a very mechanical feeling. It's yeah. it's very similar to what you'd experience like in a Wrangler. In the in the Bronco, it's all gone very electronic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the kind of attribute of the Grenadier is to go back to being mechanical where we can, where it's where it's appropriate, you right? Know, where it's possible. Obviously, this thing is safety systems on there and everything you'd expect for a road going vehicle. But we're trying to keep it simple as well, you know. Right, wh why have a switch when you can have a lever? You sure. Know? Why why create complexity? There's, there's no requirement. You know, this is this is going to work. This is not going to fail. Right. Um, it's always because it's a direct connection. So it gives us that kind of feeling of you know security and robustness and and reliability. So another thing we're also going to do as we start to move away, I'm going to get you to put the off-road switches, and I'll talk about what that does as well. That's that switch there. So. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll do, as you drive, so you have to be in drive, and okay. then, um, as you as you kind of move away, you can do that. So you just do a confirmation press on it again. Okay, so just to give you an idea, that switch there, that's obviously taken away my parking sensors. Okay. I'll stop start. The last thing I want is stop start to kick in. Right. Obviously, seatbelt warning system. I can take my seatbelts off. Let's go rid of that. It's also dampened the throttle a little bit, so just mildly put a dampening on that. Okay. Okay. It's also going to hold the gears for longer. Okay. So even though it's 
an automatic it'll hold that ratio for a longer period which is extremely useful sure yep and it's also kind of desensitized some of my traction control system my dynamic stability control so it's desensitized it which is appropriate now when you go in a low range do you have to select the off-road mode or you, can you no you don't you, have to okay. yeah, yeah yeah you don't have to it's 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 not um it but it just gives us that ability it's kind of carrying out functions that are actually appropriate right you know, things like stop start you don't want stop start kicking in when you're when you're on an ascent sure it's it's those little little things really so. Yeah, as you said, proper frame mounted recovery points right there, both front and rear. Of course, this has the European hitch, which is a really crazy design. If you're familiar with American hitches, we have the receiver there. And of course, we have the ball just bolted right onto the back of that receiver. Full size spare in the back. You can get an optional cargo area and buy, buy full doors back here. Look at this little teeny tiny door. If you wanted to carry, I don't know, four by fours or Ikea furniture and have that hanging out the back. And then you can open the side door. If I can find the lever right there right over there to the side. Um, of course, oh. the door is really heavy, so, and we're on a little bit of a hill. That's, you know, one problem I have with this kind of door design. Yeah, I mean, also noticing, like you said, um, you know, typically in a, in, a, in a high range, right, we'd be trying to go in a third gear here, exactly. and it's holding that second exactly. quite a bit longer. Yeah. So, at this point, I'm just gonna get you to go hard left now. So hard left, yep. and then we're gonna pick up another track. Wonderful. So straight across, just to the left of that bush you can see coming up. Just uh, and then as you've got that fence line, we're going to pick a truck up and go left. Yeah, sounds wonderful. That's it. So just over a little bit of complex terrain there, but you pick up that truck there. Yeah. But you can see the vehicle. I've still not enhanced traction, so I've not locked the centre differential. Right. It's just still open differential on all all axles as well as the gearbox. Well, that's a pretty unique thing with the Grenadier um, Land Cruiser offers as well, but compared to the Wrangler and the Bronco, when you go into four low, you essentially lock the front and the rear prop shaft together, the drive shaft, mm -hmm. so you get that crab effect, where you don't in this, yeah, with because, your center unlocked. Because this is, yeah, because this is permanent 4x4. Right. And that's the advantage of permanent 4x4 compared to a selectable system. That means, you know, you, you, you have a selectable, there is no question you have to enhance traction first. You have to go into four-wheel drive and lock that front front axle. Here, we've got all four wheels, but they all can turn at different speeds. So it's still. a true center differential. Yeah, it's a true yeah. center differential. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, true, yeah. Which, for those watching, I mean, that's a very expensive way to design a four-wheel drive setup, right? That's why a lot of manufacturers don't do it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. But it's why a lot of good manufacturers do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the art, the idea with being permanent four by four is well, I've got a pull as well as a push all the time. Okay, so I'm being pulled on my front axle as well as being pushed. So I'm driving, putting my torque and my spreading it out between all four wheels. Right. Which is an extremely positive thing. Especially when I'm in that, what we call interference terrain, that terrain where I'm questioning whether to enhance traction. I've already got it, okay? I've already got it, but I could still drive on a high traction surface in this position. Right. So on the nose, go straight ahead. Yep, sounds wonderful. So d does that make sense? Yeah, it, do it does make yeah. sense, yeah, yeah. What I like about the um, Grenadier as well. So drop down into that gully and then go left. Yeah, so what I'm noticing is, you know, the fundamental design of this is is decades old, right? The, the yeah. form factor in that, the belt line is super low and the roof is very tall so you end up with these big tall windows and then because it's so squared off it's easy to see the corner so dimensionally you know when you're going to hit that approach angle right or exactly. when you're going to run into something which is pretty you, cool yeah you've got great what i call reference points so you can see the corners okay and you know obviously you can see where your wheels are and it's all about you know precision over power you know exactly where to place your wheels and it gives you a lot of confidence when you're driving off road right so we're going to go hard right now yep and then you you can see a, a track ascending up that spur, yeah? Yep, climbing up the hill. Minor track. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed too in off-road mode. You know, you've got almost 300 horsepower at your right foot, yeah. uh, but it's not twitchy. Yeah. Um, and it feels like low speed power delivery is pretty good. So I know in the BMW products, it, it's kind of got a huge wallop of torque right off idle. And yeah. you're, you're definitely getting that in the straight six as well. And then stay to the left here. Yeah, you got it. Yep, so, uh, wonderful. Anti-clockwise right to the left. So we've got descent control on here. Okay, which is that switch, and that switch is just a single press. So whenever you've got an opportunity where you've got what's got a limit point, you've lost sight of the track, really useful thing to put in, in terms of being able to, uh, you know, descent control the vehicle. Right. And it operates the brakes independently and individually, but it's a really good system because what it doesn't have 
it doesn't go above the target speed so a lot of descent controls have a target speed they allow it to go above and then and then retract it sure what this does is dictate a target speed and then doesn't let it go above that can you adjust the target speed you can yeah great question so in terms of my adjustment it's actually on my cruise control. Cruise control, yeah. So, so once I've selected HD or DC, this one here. So if you just press that button there. Yeah. Okay, so solid light. Once a solid light's on, then I can fine tune. So to decelerate my speed is the bottom button, and then to accelerate it is the top button. Is there a place where it tells you what it's set yeah, at? Yeah. So that, okay. that's that's I now I now have my. I know that HD or DC is in. Wonderful. Is so look, Alex, 70 plus thousand dollars in the US, you know, for that kind of money, you're gonna get yourself a pretty nicely equipped BMW Mercedes Lexus model. True. In here, you're gonna find plastic floors, rubber floor mats, not a lot of quality in terms of premium materials on the dash, but one of the coolest dash layouts, I think, in the industry. Yeah. It, and this is, this is very, very personal. And I know that a lot of the fans over on Auto Buyer's Guide, my channel, not a fan of this button bank. I think this is absolutely fantastic. I love the little handles around the hazard light button there. I love the chunky buttons, things like that. I will admit though, this BMW shifter, little discordant uh, with this absolutely epic ball shifter there for the two-speed transfer case. Love that. Love the steering wheel here. Love the fact that we have a little toot button uh, in addition to the horn honk in the middle. But really what I think is fantastic is this massive button bank up top. I have never seen anything like this. I mean, I guess the original Hummer, the, the military one maybe, but this is all kinds of cool. Differential locks, front and rear, off-road modes up here, emergency telematics, downhill assistance, exterior lights. And then these are all pre-wired auxiliary switches. There's even a 500 amp auxiliary switch, which is kind of cool. Now, word of warning, apparently if you don't get this from the factory, it's gonna be a bear to add it on later, but they said you could. Uh, also, you could get uh, the sunroofs here, two, two sunroofs, one on each side. Pretty cool. Now, I love the seat material. First of all, yeah. it's like a neoprene with this woven material made by Recaro. Recaro. Very cool design, and they feel so high quality. They do feel great. I thought that there would be a power seat, but I haven't seen one so far. It does look like the seats, if you look at the side of the seat, has some cutouts where I think power controls would go one day. Don't know exactly what's gonna happen for the US market though. One thing I don't love is the instrument cluster is incorporated into the center screen. So you can see yeah. you got your miles per hour, your rev counter there. Let's, uh, let's, let's turn it on and see what that looks like. Yeah, let's see how they did with it the It is a crank shifter. Oh, gotta put my foot on there. There we go. And uh, there we go, that's what the infotainment looks like. It does offer CarPlay and Android Auto. Uh, ignore the transmission error there. Apparently this is a early pre-production prototype. It sure is, yeah, but look, you got, you got hard buttons down here to grab some of the, um, um, you know, quick settings. You got off-road yeah. pages. It looks like. Yeah. So if you uh, if you're wearing gloves while you're off-roading or working in the you know on the back 40 something like that, you can easily adjust the controls instead of just using the touchscreen. But then everything is touch enabled and pretty logical. I think this look is fairly clean. Um, it also you know it's a little closer to the driver and the eye line than than a, like a big electric car display would be. Those are usually a little bit lower. This is cool. So you have onboard battery information mm -hmm. where you can tell your state of charge. So if you're yeah, accessing that cool. battery for accessories, you know what the output is. You got navigation information. It's not it's not the prettiest nav I've ever seen, but it seems pretty easy to use overall. I kind of like the I kind of like the stark functionality of it though. Not a big fan of the fact that over here we just get warning lights. I mean, at least the warning lights are there rather than in the middle, but that is a little bit silly. This steering wheel, love it, love it, except for the uh, the logo. I think actually a little bit odd on the logo, but the buttons, everything else is really nice and chunky. Uh, the key, what do you think of this switchblade key? I think it's awesome. I really? love I love old school keys. Very Volkswagen in a way. Yeah, you know, they're but lock that apparently is the, the, uh, horn. the horn, the alarm there. So, you know, panic alarm, got one of those, check. So one thing I love about the rear seat is it's very much elevated over the front. So when you sit yeah. in the back seat, you get this stadium seating effect where you look down upon the world. And I love the headroom. I can keep my glasses on my head, still have a lot of headroom left. If you've got a tall family, this is way roomier than something like a Bronco or a Wrangler. Of course, its roof does not come off. And that's part of why we get that extra headroom. Yeah, that's right. And Alex, other limitation if you want to hop out, there is no two-door model. So Bronco and Wrangler are available in the two-door trim. There is a pickup truck coming though called the Quarter Master. You can see it over there up on that hill. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, not as many configurations. Also, if you want to talk about shear out specs, right? This is, I think, a 32, 33 inch tall tire. True. Yeah. Versus 35s you can get on the yeah. Bronco and the Wrangler. And of course, with solid axles, that's the only way you're going to increase ground clearance is bigger tires. Yeah, because the axle doesn't move. Yep. Um, and then, of course, uh, towing capacity on this is way more than Bronco or Forerunner or Wrangler. But you know what would be epic? What? Portal axles. Okay, that's a little much. It's already Portal 80 grand, axle. Alex. Let's the ride quality feels pretty good. You know, one of the concerns you get with a lot of, especially front solid axle vehicles, you get a lot of head toss. Um, I don't think there's a way to disconnect the front stabilizer bar or sway bar on this no, vehicle. Um, and maybe, you know, the aftermarket will come up with a solution. But even on this relatively mild terrain, like it's uh, it's it's not as much head toss as I've experienced in a lot of Wrangler products. Yep. Um, and I think a lot of that's down to the spring rate. It's, uh, it's sprung a little bit more firm than some of the newer, newer Wranglers, but um, uh, other thing I'm noticing too is that you're talking about the worm and gear steering, right? Yep. The, the steering ratio is very slow, which is not what you want on road, but in this terrain, it allows you to really finely place the, the front end of the vehicle. Well, we're going to start picking up wheels if I had to take a guess. We're going to get fully articulated. Okay. Yeah. So, an interesting observation from you you're going to start picking up wheels. So, any other vehicle, you go over there, I guarantee a wheel will go light. Right. Okay? Or in the air, okay? You'll put a wheel in the air. This vehicle has phenomenal wheel travel, okay? Now, what we will do to enhance traction, because it's what I call undulating terrain, mm -hmm. we'll engage center diff lock only. Yep. But I'm gonna show you, so if you can do that, just and you could do that on the move. You need the plunger? Yep. Or just so just pull a plunger up, yep. pull a, pull a little detent, that's it, and then, so, and that, bear in mind, that can be done on the move, not a problem. So as you're looking at future terrain, you can just, yep, center diff lock. I know now I've prepped the vehicle up for that more dynamic conditions. Wonderful. So if you just go dead straight now, keep slightly left of that red marker. Yep. Want me to pop outside? Yeah, you want to film it? Pop Do you mind from the, the outside? outside? Yeah, that'd be huge. Thank you, Alex. Sorry, I'm kind of that's okay. in, No, I'm no, tell you where you're, to go you're doing a well, great so job. No, no, so this is this is exactly you. what I want. Work discussion. This is exactly what I want. This is wonderful. You watch what happens over here. What's quite interesting is you you picked up on something. I, obviously, I'm aware that you, you're a very experienced off-road driver. Any other vehicle would have a wheel in the air over here. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens with this vehicle. All right. You feel a wheel spin, okay? Yeah. Or the lack of wheel spin, which is why it's so efficient. So, so, um, so just at the moment, so if you, yeah, that's yeah, good. That's so good. keep going dead straight. You go dead straight. So at this point, so the right vehicles, about here, you'd be pretty, yeah. pretty stuck. You would. Yeah. Okay. So just watch what happens now. Okay, we're just going to crawl it. Okay. Yep. Every wheel is still on the ground, even at that point there. Now, a lot of people ask, I get a lot of comments on the page, you know, why do you want solid axles? This is why you want solid axles, because they act as a teeter-totter. Um, yeah, that was good. That was really good. So certainly, probably close to the max articulation of this vehicle, but I didn't feel any lift up of any of the wheels. There's none. Okay, so if you know about the talked about the beam axles on this vehicle right okay. vehicles got beam axles with long travel coil springs uh, they're actually progressive springs as well but one of the things about the beam axles on here we've got four links and then a paneled rod but those four links allow it to droop much further than most vehicles okay right so you have quite comparable wheel travel however the vehicle has much more droop on the axles than most off-road vehicles of its kind of genre right and it means that you have much more opportunity of putting a ground pressure with a tire which means you're going to get grip and that's what that kind of determines one of the design factors of this vehicle and one of the kind of limiting factors of most vehicles is suspension this has phenomenal wheel travel so it means in an undulating terrain it's going to get fantastic ground pressure well and the fun thing too is um one of the interesting things too is like when you look at what Land Rover has done with the new Defender gun, full independent and four corner air suspension, a lot of people think it's the up travel that matters. But when you go into the off road height, you have no down travel. And then you're essentially riding on a skateboard in that. Sure, I'm on the nose now. Yeah. Through yeah. the obstacle here, okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah, sorry, go for it. So, this is where I would use axle diff locks. Okay. okay? So, this is a good opportunity. Wanna hop out here too, Alex? So Thanks, buddy. If you just, if you just, once you, your man jumps out, yeah. if you go back, I'm going to show you something now. Because So you just talked about something that's really interesting. This vehicle, when you do go into that terrain where you exceed that wheel travel, because there is a limit on any vehicle of course. where you exceed it, that's where I'm going to use the traction enhancement, axle diff lock. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're going to manually select them. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So if you go back a bit and we'll give them 
give them chance to engage obviously because we're a little bit well it would engage but I'm, I'm giving you a chance to kind of uh, look at it and then say you know something I can do it on the move right because you can select those on the move as long as you're not spinning the wheels and you've got low engine RPM you're not you know not you as long as you're not got loads of momentum you can put rear axle diff lock in so, so it's a solid press just out of curiosity if I had pushed the front would it have locked both or yeah, do you have to go no, rear no, and then no, front? You to, okay. Yeah, you have to go rear and then front. Gotcha. So, so at the moment she's flashing. So if you just go forward, you'll see it go solid. Yeah, it's solid pretty quick. Straight, straight away. I don't know if you've uh, had any yeah. experience in, in the US. We get Tacoma and 400 yeah, by Toyota. I've driven them a lot, yeah. Diff lock spent a lot of time yeah, flashing yeah, yeah. at you, yeah. which just drives me crazy. Yeah. A little bit to the right. Okay, yep, yeah, wonderful. Will the vehicle let you two foot it? Have you? No, you don't, don't need brakes, no. no. Yeah. Yeah, that transition's pretty smooth. Yeah, yeah it feels good. It feels really quite good. Okay. What I do like about this too is it actually lines up the diff locks in order, which is cool. Yeah. So you got rear center and then I assume if you lock the front you get a front up there as well. Um, it's pretty cool, so you can clearly see what which which axles locked at any given time. Yeah, it's quite good. All right, are we ready? Yep. Um, so it looks like low range defaults to probably second gear from a start, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you can manually select it down into a uh, down into first if you needed to. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Diff lock out. Works good. Yeah, I'm impressed. You know, it's it's really pretty impressive the amount of comfort that this brings to the equation. Um, you know, size-wise, it feels a lot, I think Alex Dykes pointed out earlier, but it feels a lot bigger inside width-wise than something like a Wrangler or a Bronco. Um, and, and part of the, the effect of having so much room in here is, is be due to the fact you got these glass panels and you get the headroom. You know, the headroom makes it feel a lot more airy than I was expecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the only concern I have from, this is just a very Merkin <laughs> viewpoint, but um, I think it'd be hard to put a much larger tire on from the factory, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like the wheel well is, is pretty restrictive, um, but you also get a good tire from the factory, right? The KO2 is probably my favorite tire on the market. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Commentary for the peanut gallery, portal axles. Portal you portal axles. axles, Alex wants Way portals. All right, so going down the hill, we can click on uh, trail descent. I tell you what's quite refreshing, gentlemen, is to be next to people actually have got a lot of off-road experience, and uh, yeah, you, you guys, um, yeah, it's uh, quite, quite positive things. All right, guys, so an amazing first opportunity in the Grenadier. Now, obviously, this terrain was very mild. We're going to have to get it out to Colorado, run it through some real trails to see how it performs in real off-road terrain. Now, how does it compare to the Bronco and the Wrangler? This is not a rock crawler. You know, it is capable of doing, you know, mild to medium duty on the rocks, but it's got a long wheelbase. It's got a relatively small tire compared to some of their offerings from Ford and Jeep. Um, pretty on par with Toyota. This is a long distance overland cruiser to take you to some really inhospitable parts of the world. Um, I'm really curious to see what the American reception is going to be. 71.5 starting, a lot of money. But we live in a market now where even a standard Wrangler often case is going to be 60, 65, 70 grand. And then you got the 392, which is 90 grand plus, same with the Bronco Raptor. So compared to those, this vehicle is kind of in the ballpark and it offers some interesting features that you don't get on those rides um, from the utilitarian standpoint. So I'd love to hear your opinion of this new uh, Grenadier. That back there is a the Trailmaster. I got a video on that over at TFL Now. All sorts of other coverage from the Goodwood Festival of Speed over there. And as always, I'm Tommy. We'll see you on the next video.